Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming in today and spending your evening with me. I'm sure that Mr. Worthington is compensating you guys very fairly, as you guys deserve. Now, I'm sure that as American students, we've all heard how we were unfairly compensated during the whole pre-revolution mess. And so we've heard growing up, oh, the Boston Tea Party was just one of many things that uh, England did to torture us as Americans. They were so evil, King George hated Americans, he despised us. This is terrible. Well, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that is so incorrect. As we kind of delve into history today, I expect us to understand that Britain was actually probably looking out for our best interests. Um, that they were actually taxing us to maintain an army here because of hostilities with Indians and possible interference from Spanish and French influences. And as a result, the Boston Tea Party was an overreaction by um, specific rich people who were looking to benefit most from their, uh, their interactions with the mobocracy, which we'll kind of get into a little bit. So this is the Boston Tea Party, what actually happened, what you won't read in textbooks here in America. So, as you guys are familiar with, this is a little document that describes the Boston Massacre, which I'm sure you guys are thinking, oh yes, terrible event. British soldiers fired upon the masses of Americans, or American colonists, at this point there's a distinction because they're still Englishmen, they're still English, uh, they have the rights of Englishmen, but they're living in the American colonies, so Americans is kind of a misnomer. But they open fired on them during, from a snowball. Well, this is, of course, uh, an image re recreated by Paul Revere. But, if you guys look, there's a couple of deficiencies in this. For one, let's take a look at this little pop right here. It's kind of blurry, so I apologize for that. I don't know about you guys, but if the British were opening fire on soldiers, or on people, I don't think that there's going to be a little dog that's just kind of hanging around. He's going to be running for the hills, scared for his life. Now, of course, if you also look at this, you've got a bunch of white people in the Americas. Um, granted, at this time, there are a majority of white people. You still have black slaves, you still have various other um, sorts of kind of traitors or um, people who would be interacting. So, for it to be an all-white crowd is, of course, kind of a misnomer. So, when we look at this, we can kind of look at the image of propaganda. Now, what propaganda is, is it's described by Web Webster's as being the spreading of ideas, information, or rumor for the purpose of helping or injuring a particular cause or person or institution. When we look at what this um, image of what the Boston Massacre was trying to do is, it's an effect by, um, or an effort by Paul Revere to basically create this kind of false image of what, how people should view the English uh, as oppressive, as monstrous, as demonic. And so that's what this image conveys. Of course, you can see, you can spot the inaccuracies in it, the fallacies, and why we should be convinced by such a document. It's important, of course, for us to look back at that and use that as kind of a reference material for the dominant ideology, not dominant, for the minority ideology at the time. We'll get into that in a second. But um, it's also important to realize that this is not the dominant feelings of everybody else. So now the question is, um, why propaganda? Propaganda is going to become an important method for the Sons of Liberty to basically control the, the theory uh, that, or not the theory, the discourse of the time, the conversation that's going on. Um, one thing you should read into the Sons of Liberty is that this is wealthy white landowners. This is not for the people, by the people. This is for the rich, by the rich, the 1% who are trying to basically further enhance their holdings in America. They're trying to denounce the English king because they are being taxed. Of course, the question becomes, why propaganda? Because historians have debated this. Paul Gillia, in his um, writing, The Makings of the American Public, writes that in the years preceding the American Revolution, the American colonists were the least taxed people in the world. Think about that for a second. American colonists are taxed less than British citizens, taxed less than in India, where there's the British East India Company, Tax less than um, French taxes the Frenchmen, Germany, or not Germany, the Holy Roman Empire taxes their people, uh, tithes, you know, etc. Um, so you've got the least taxed people in America. There's absolutely no reason for this revolt, unless if you've got the rich trying to become richer. When we think about that today, we think again how about these, you know, the Mitt Romneys of the world who enhance their wealth by becoming more wealthy. Um, and this is something that we can trace back to this American Revolution, to the wealthy, again, trying to enhance that wealth. Um, if the colonists, again, were the least taxed people in the world, why the uprising? 
I think we can use something in popular culture to kind of help us think about this. How many of you guys have seen The Lion King? Oh, God. Every hand should be up to the <laughs> See, this is, why, this is why I love The Lion King. I love Scar. He's a fantastic image of a villain. Think about who Scar is for a second. He's Mufasa's brother. Mufasa, of course, king of the pride lands, pride of everything that is right in the world of the lions. Um, and his brother is Scar. So Scar has this access to um, the, basically the perks of being royalty because he is the king's brother. He's a prince, in effect. But the main thing with Scar is that um, he is kind of the black sheep of the family. Scar will never be king as long as Mufasa is alive. And then Simba is born, meaning that Scar will never have access to that. The wealthy people of America, you know, if you think about this at the time, are wealthy. They have access to British Parliament, but as long as the king is in control, as long as there's British Parliament, they'll never have direct access to it. And so ultimately, what Scar is going to do is he's going to rally the hyenas and use them as a scapegoat to basically kill Mufasa, and then he's going to hide behind them. So the colonists in this way, the Sons of Liberty, are going to excuse me, are going to rally the hyenas, that is, um, the colonists at the time, and in this kind of effort against King George, and then they're going to hide behind them saying, oh, it's the popular sovereignty that King George be turned down, when in reality, the Sons of Liberty are a minority view. You've probably got about a 50-50% split on the eve of a revolution in terms of supporting the king versus um, going against the king, and this is well before it. So, the Boston Tea Party, of course, is going to be a controversial effect. If you guys look at this art painting, um, it kind of creates this contemporary image of what the Boston Tea Party is. You've got, you know, the mobs cheering, yes, throw that tea overboard, forget you, King George, we hate you. And you've got, of course, the Mohawks, who are throwing the tea overboard. This is not the Sons of Liberty who is doing it, it's the Mohawks. And so, not only have the colonists joined the Sons of Liberty in this event, but you also have the Mohawk Indians uniting with their fellow white people, who of course they would hate at this time, because the white people just take Indians' lands, but we won't mention that for the sake of this Whig history that we've constructed. You've got the Mohawks joining and symbolically throwing the tea over, showing that all of America is united against King George, when in reality, again, you've got, um, you've got the, the minority Sons of Liberty controlling everything. Um, this is the act of the elite to control the mob, and mobocracy is a concept that evol evolves at this time. Mobocracy is basically, um, you've got a bunch of people who will rally the tar and feather and effigy various people, and so you've got kind of these common people who will do whatever's in front of them, and because of the group mentality, everybody will join in. So what mobocracy then becomes is, it becomes an effort of controlling what the mob does, setting their agenda. And so the Sons of Liberty try to set this agenda against the people, basically, that they oppose, in this case, Parliament and King George. So this is basically going to be what arrives as a result of that. Um, this act, of course, unites the British um, Parliament against the American colonies. Sympathies are going to be lost. A major important part of this to know is that you've got um, people in Parliament who sympathize with the American cause, who say, yes, they cannot be directly involved with us, as a result, we need to take sympathy on them, you know, we can't tax them a bunch, which is why they were the least taxed. But now you've got the Americans throwing this tea overboard, and it's absolutely ridiculous in their mind that, you know, you've got just a small tax that's added up. Um, kind of a fun fact for you guys, the amount of taxes that were collected from the colonists was supposed to pay for half of what the Quartering Act was, um, which was to station soldiers in America for the protection of the colonists. So you've got only half of that revenue being raised from taxes, and the other half is being paid by the Crown. So this is really not demanding for them to be asked to pay into this sort of fund for them. All these sympathies are going to be lost because it's like we barely asked them to pay anything, and they even refuse to do that. This is ridiculous. And so as a result, you are going to see um, kind of this, these intolerable acts come through. You're going to see the Boston, or the Port of Boston closed as a result of that um, uprising. Basically, what the Tea Party was, in our mind, is the symbolic throwing over the tea to protest the Tea Act, which was another tax, as I already mentioned, um, because of the difficulties in uh, getting revenue from the East India Company, which was struggling at this time. But what it really is, is it shows the dominance of these, these few people who control everything and kind of set the agenda against the English king as it's going to kind of progress into the revolution as itself.
that's pretty much all I have for you guys. Thanks. Hold up, sorry, real quick. I'm losing some things. Again, they're going to be antagonized by the British. They're going to say, down with King George, throw him over the cliff. Um, up until this time, King George was really popular. And even up until the eve of the revolution, you've got, um, you've got the colonists saying, extending the Olive Branch petition, saying, we love you, King George. Please take us back. Stop hating us. We just want to serve you. Um, so ultimately, you're going to have this image of these three, whoops, of these three sons of liberty bravely leading the men into battle, blah, 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 blah. When in reality, the sons of liberty can best be described as selfish instigators of war. That's pretty cool.